Welcome to the second part of the interview with Richard Lang for The Lucid Truth. During the first half, Richard and I discussed the headless way and how we are all this space of conscious awareness, this nothingness that makes room for everything. A quick way to represent this is as follows. Notice that your consciousness is not in your head. Rather, your head is within your consciousness, the field of awareness that everything is appearing in, including sounds, sights, imagination, and even thoughts. If that's confusing to you, I recommend the first half, which is the 14th episode of The Lucid Truth. Now, Richard and I discuss free will and the nature of the self in this episode. Interestingly enough, the philosopher Sam Harris uses Richard Lang's rhetoric on headlessness to support the notion that free will does not exist and that the self is an illusion. You can find that on the Illusory Self episode of the Making Sense podcast, where Sam interviews Richard Lang, or in Sam's book, Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion, in reference to Douglas Harding. As you can tell in this interview, Richard supports the idea of free will in a way, and also views the self as something that can exist within a certain perspective. After the interview with Richard, I will explain more about my thoughts about free will, which will be explored further and even debated with skeptics in further episodes. So I hope you stick around for that. So here is The Free Self with Richard Lang. I'd like to talk to you about what the self is. And what it means to kind of how it can make sense. So the historical Buddha himself identified attachment to the egocentric self to be the root of all suffering, the Durka. And so I think this version of the self is an illusion. So we have to understand what the self is not to understand what the self is. Yes. Well, okay. Um, I I took take the view the the developmental view. You see, when you're a baby, you're headless and you don't know what you are or who you are, and you've no language yet, no sense of self and other, and or, or you know certainly no developed sense of it. And through language, as you're growing up, you learn to see yourself. As others see you, you learn to imagine what you look like at three feet, ten feet, which is a person. And you look in the mirror, and there's that image. And you learn to sort of put it on. So that's what they call identification. Uh, now, that is absolutely vital to do, because you, you can't function in society, of course. You know, you have no idea who you are if you don't do that. So we all do that growing up. So we all become aware, self-conscious, which is, in these terms, being aware of what you look like from a re certain range. And, of course, you then develop that and become aware of what you look like at closer ranges. You have to, you know, that you're made of organs and the, you, these are made of cells, you know, and that your, your body is part of a society which is move, stepping back, which is part of a country and a planet, you know. So... We don't think of these as different, you know, as myself, but it is. It, it, you could do. You could say, well, I am Richard, but I'm also the planet. You know, and I am, yes. London. you know, I identify with London. I support London. I support England. I support this planet if we were invaded by Mars, you know. So the, this is, once you see that at center you're no thing, it me it it un unties you from being fixed just on the one in the mirror, and you realize, oh, my reality is this no thing, which you could say is my true self, which is yes. of, yeah, my which is true of everything. But I've got these other intermediate selves which I need and function with, you know, that uh, my my human individual, my family, my country, my planet, my cells, you know. 
Now, uh, th this is a, a new way of thinking about what you are, but it makes sense. It, uh, now, is identifying with Richard, uh, you know, like the Buddha said, a cause of suffering? Well, of course it is. <laughs> you know, yes. You know, life is suffering, and it's not wrong. Uh, but l what you are doing, just as it's face there to no face here, it's suffering there to no suffering here, like it was the tense hand to no tension here. And you won't get rid of suffering, but you can place it. You know, you won't get rid of stress, but you can place it and see that you're not stressed, the stress is in, in you. That you're not suffering, the suffering is in you. Now, this is at meditation. You don't learn it, you, you attend. Uh, and, it's not, and it's not always easy, but that is, uh, you know, that's paying attention to the way things are set up. So, you see, I love having a self. I love having have, have all kind, you know, being having different layers to myself. I, I think this is wonderful. And I can say that because I'm aware of looking out of this, my true self, which includes everything, and like the mirror, you know. Yeah. Yes, you have a, I like framing it this way, you have a core self, and this is your first dimensional self, the headless self. And yes. this is just yourself as open consciousness, the empty container for everything that is free from being defined by its contents. Yeah. And then you have your whole self, your three dimensional self, the self you are for others. And you can improve this self by realizing who you really are as the first person. And yeah. I think a balance is key. It's like Douglas said about stage four of the balanced life, private as well as, pu as public and public as well as private. Yes, that's right. Two sides. Yes. When you find out who you are, you, you don't throw away your identification with being a person. I mean, you've worked hard for that and you need that. You know, and it does not get in the way. It's it it helps you be aware of your true self. It's a kind of sounding board. Yeah. Yes, it's um, uh, uh, to quote Douglas again: "Total self loss is total self fulfillment." This yeah. is how you get your way at last by stopping all pretense and being yourself. Yes. Well, there you go. You see. So this is very natural. And what we're talking about is what we all are, your listener as well. And your listener will be thinking about it differently and feeling different, have different realizations about it. Of course you would. And you, you won't have the same as me or Isaac or, or anyone else. Uh, and uh, my role here is to reassure you, if I can, that that is the way it is. That's fine. You've got the basic experience, which is kind of non-experience, Point back at your no face. There it is. See, uh, be aware of your single eye. Close your eyes. How big are you? You know, it is accessible. It's, it is available, and you can't do it wrong. But you will think about it and react to it differently, uh, and that that is the way it is. And, and so there isn't, a, you know, we're not really talking about something that you haven't got. We're talking about what you've got, but we're we're sharing our different responses to it, and that's all it is. You know, it, uh, the the thing itself, the no thing itself, is nearer to you than your breathing. And uh, if you you know, as I've said, if you think, well, I, I so what? I don't feel anything. Exactly. Don't be fooled by that. That is it. Uh, it is deceptive. It, it you know. It, but it's the truth, you see, I'd say, and you can verify it now. It's the place you're looking out of. I'm looking out of nothing into, well, the sky's cleared of it. It's a bit blue and sunny now. So, uh, you know, the view out is always changing. Uh, but the place we're looking from is the same because it's got no one's name on it and no one's nationality uh, or address. And that this is what we all have in common. And this brings us together. And uh, here we are one. There we're many. Here we're one. And so I say to the listener, well, uh, wonderful to be you, you know, to share this one consciousness. You've got a very different view out, different reactions, but there's only one consciousness in my experience. And I'm celebrating that 
uni union and unity with with the listener and with you isaac and with everyone really yeah yes uh it reminds me of a quote in your book wisdom tells me i am nothing love tells me i am everything and between the two my life flows yeah, it's a lovely way of putting that that isn't it yes music of or someone i don't know but yes yes it, you've got to You've got what the most important bit is your true nature, which is no thing full of everything. Yeah. Yes, it's possible to find one's face without losing one's no face. Yes, have both. Have your cake and eat it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, okay. So I think that that really covered the self like I wanted to because I wanted to describe how the self is an illusion, how a version of the self is an illusion, to understand what the self truly is. And I think we did a very nice job of doing that for our listeners. Yeah, and, I, you know, uh, you could say, though, that you can't understand the self, you know, that you can understand things. I could understand Richard a bit, you know, but not much, really, but a bit, you know, I understand this and that. But myself, you know, this emptiness full of everything, I don't know where to begin, you know, it, it, and yet I am it, you see, it, it is real. But the, the, the idea I can understand this is, is uh, yeah, you know, it's just nonsense. <laughs> yeah, it, I think it makes more sense to say you can be it. Yes, well, you can't not be it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be quite the um, achievement. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Certainly impossible. I've, I've lost myself. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. It's like talking about uh, space and like imagining the rocks. Like yes. you're still conscious of them. That's right. Yeah. Yes. I think so. Okay. So I think I want to do the same thing with the self that we did. I want to do the same thing with free will that we did with the self. Understanding oh. what free will is not to understand what it is. And so in having no head... Um, Harding says it's responsible for everything that comes about. It wills nothing and all things. And in the toolkit for testing the incredible hypothesis, he said it is voluntary at will. You can be the view without being lost in it. It's the fifth power, willing all things. You can will whatever is in this space. And I think he's totally right about that. This awareness of first personhood, of headlessness, is the highest degree of freedom that I truly believe one can attain for themselves. It's a kind of meditation that allows you to freely choose what energies within consciousness you want to interact with. While the, the consciousness, though, it can't reject anything that comes into it. I mean, it's going to come in. But once it's come in, seeing them as existing within your awareness allows you to restrict your power over you. As capacity for the world, you can make your world what you will it to be more readily. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's your way of putting it, Isaac, and go for it. You know, and I, I think that we'll all put it slightly differently. And in the end, uh, the truth is nonverbal and you can't pin it down. And uh, I, I think that when you get to the level of sort of you know, absolutes, like people, if they say, you know, there's no free will, everything just happens, you know, I, I think as soon as you say that, you probably say the opposite, and it'll be equally true. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I, and and I think paradox, is, it's, it definitely has its place, and I, and I think if some, if you, if you meet someone who's stuck on one end of a paradox, you know, that's a bit fundamentalist, really, uh, you know, there there is no free will. Well, you see, the opposite, you could say, is that, well, my anything, anything is not free because it's pushed around by other things. You know, it's conditioned. But no thing is not pushed around. You are not. There's nothing outside you, so there's nothing to push you around. So you're free. Um, but yet, do you, you know, do you actually make a conscious choice that this present moment is going to be the way it is? Well, no, but it's flowing from you, so you could say that it is your will. So these are different ways of, of thinking about it, and I love all that stuff. 
um, I, I think that I've learned that uh, you can't pin it down to one end of a you know paradox really. Um, so uh, yes, completely the, the, right. Yeah, you're totally right. I think it both are just frames of reference, and both are true within their own respect. Yes, you know I uh, I, I think you could. You, you can look at the great religions and you can, Douglas Harding did this, his, his idea, and you can sort of see how they're all coming from the same root, which is this experience of who you are, but they express different aspects of it. So Christianity, you could boil it down to self-giving love, for example. And Hinduism, you could say it's really kind of aware of the one self, the one self. Now, uh, Islam, you could say, is about surrender, surrender to the will of God, you know, uh, in Allah or whatever they, it is, you know, that, that all happens, uh, uh, you know, you're not in control, it's God. Now, there's that, you see. But then if you look at Taoism, Taoism uh, uh, and Zen, Taoism is the opposite. It's like freedom, spontaneity. Uh, and you, you see, you, you, there you get it coming out. Uh, you, you, it's not just one end of the spectrum, and this ele this there's this recognition that you're not as a person in control, but the one is, is a kind of surrender, and there's a deep freedom in that acceptance of things flowing from the source. But at the same time, there's immense spontaneity and creativity going on, and freedom of expression. And uh, that, that is real too, you see. So uh, I wouldn't have one without the other either, either one of them without, you know, the other. Yeah. Yes, it does appear to be a true paradox. The, um, the other day, my friend offered me a drink and um, I was thinking about all of this stuff. And I said, I have no choice whether or not to drink this anymore because I have chosen to drink it. <laughs> and then you decided not to. <laughs> <laughs> I still did, but that would be Every funny day. if I didn't. <laughs> like that would be a funny way to prove well, my you point. See, I, I mean, it it is is you know one level it, it's very all very serious, but another level it's very amusing, you know. Yes, it is. It can be very funny. I think um, for me, I can see how the belief that free will is an illusion can be good for some people, but for me, I like to say that I am. And I do exist rather than saying I happen to have existed. It's like the difference from I am doing versus I am happening. And I feel like maybe certain forms of free will don't exist. But if you view free will existing on a spectrum, you can see how headlessness can make one more free. I think headlessness is a way to give your true self free will, at least in the only <laughs> sense that it could exist. Okay, all right. Well, there you go. <laughs> yes, I think it's so I, absolutely I, I, amazing. I, I have no no power to argue with that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I wanted to ask you, Richard, do you ever dream about being headless? Yes, yes, I have done, yes. Yes, I'm very curious what that's like. I'm sure it will come about one of these days. Well, I, I, you know, I think when things touch you deeply, they, you know, they probably come out in your dreams from time to time. And uh, so that's understandable. But, you, you know, I just, it, here's another paradox. The world is very real. At the same time, it's a dream. You know, it's the one dreaming, but it is absolutely real. You, you know, the people who get, say, oh, it's just a dream. It's just a, 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 an illusion. I've got half the point, but I'm missing the other one, which is the profound, poignant reality of it as well. Uh, so, uh, yes, you it, dreaming, and and the world is a dream, but the world is beautiful. You know, it's like you know it's a dream because you can compare it with reality when you wake up, and a dream is different from reality because for lots of reasons, you know, it's different. So you can compare it. You can say it's a dream because you can compare it with reality. But the whole thing, you can't compare. So, you know, you're saying, well, it's not real. And you say, well, compared to what? <laughs> yes, yes. It's just like the the size of the landscape. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
Yes, I had a dream where I was uh, meditating recently, and in the dream, I actually watched my thoughts. And when I looked at them, they collapsed. And behind the thoughts was just experience. And this experience is like, like if you imagine having a head and you try to do something, it's going to make it harder to do. <laughs> but if you imagine having no head, that's like when you're taken by the movie of life, when you're in the natural state of flow, when you're really in the present moment, you don't imagine yourself having a head. But you don't imagine yourself not having. You just don't. You know, yes. It's, it, you don't have to imagine you've no head. I I'm sure you weren't meaning this. I imagine you weren't meaning it. But you, you just don't. You're just empty. You know, you're just, it's the way it's given. It works. Yes. It's true. Yeah. Yes, that would almost interfere in the same way as imagining having yes, a head. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's far more kind of simple and natural uh, but you see, you, you've really got to have imagined a, f a head here before you can see there isn't one. Um, if you know, it's the absence of your head is in contrast to the idea you had one, and that that is, it's, it's wonderful to imagine your head here because then you get the surprise and and kind of ring of truth. Oh, I actually I don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And then it becomes very, once you see it for the first time, I think it becomes easier to see afterwards. Once oh, you notice completely. it after you've lost it. Well, that's the mark of it, is once you've seen it, uh, it's always accessible. I mean, you, you can't, you know, put forward the excuse that you don't know where it is. I mean, you point at it. And you can't put, you know, you don't have to sort of crank it up. It's just immediately 100% full power as soon as you look. Um, if you're, you know, that's where people who are not aware of this, they get rather caught up in, in chasing some kind of experience and uh, trying to recreate it or, you know, create it. But this is just look, there it is, 100%. On. Yeah. Yes, and I, I truly believe that this way of seeing is part of the evolution of human consciousness. This, well, I mean, it must be because we're aware of it, and we're, you know, so here it is. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this yeah. finding this balance between your whole third person self and your core first person self, as it existing as both to reinforce each other. This is the highest degree of freedom of will. You can truly know yourself, and in doing so, you can be truly free. And none of it requires having a head. <laughs> well, I think you need your head, but not at the center. It's the blonde that yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and, it, and it's terribly natural and down to earth and normal and loving and uh, practical. And... Um, you know, we've all got it, and we're sort of kind of waxing lyrical about it, but we've all got this, and we all are it. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I'm aware that, you know, that time uh, is there, and there's no time here. Um, you know, I look from the timeless into time, and I'm not in time. Time is in me, but I'm aware that the time is passing. <laughs> yes. So... Uh, we probably start to think about drawing this to a, a, a close in the timeless. Uh, wh what do you think? <laughs> I think we've sorted out the universe. Yes, and I hope our listeners try some of the experiments for themselves so they can experience the real freedom of the true self. I yeah. think they will. Well, I hope so. Otherwise, you know, that uh, uh, they're missing out. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that interview with Richard. It was one of the best on the show so far. I want to explore the idea of free will more, and explain how it can be understood in a realistic context. Just as a disclaimer, this is not an argument for the idea of free will. It is an observation of a perceptual heuristic that many find enhances subjective well-being in meaningful ways experience can be supplemented 
with attitudes that involve owning one's existence and controlling one's destiny without accepting or rejecting the notion of determinism. The traditional notion of free will, simply put, doesn't make a lot of sense. The idea that a human being can transcend their environment in a way that exceeds the limitations of nature is incompatible with objective reality. This is commonly thought of as the idea of free will, and is the common target of philosophers and thinkers around the world, for good reason. However, there is another version of free will that is not commonly considered, and it is this version that I am interested in defending. This is the attitude of free will. The attitude of free will is simply the perspective that you control your own destiny, and one can understand how this can be true in a perceptual way, rather than an ideological one. In seeing this expanded position, it is my hope that those who deny the existence of free will can see why people are so resistant to giving it up, and how we can better reach others with scientific truths. It is helpful to make an analogy to illustrate this point. If an unconscious robot suddenly gained the capacity for consciousness, it is fair to say it now has free will in a perceptual sense. This is something that needs to be viewed from the first-person perspective, similar to the idea of having no head. After all, you clearly have a head, but if you refuse to see from this perspective, you'll miss the point. The robot now has capacity for self-reflection. It can see its environment. If we view this from Sam Harris's perspective, quote, If you realize the universe is pulling your strings, you can pull yourself up by your own strings, end quote. The robot can now see its strings, pulling itself up by its very own bootstraps. Now, to be fair, this is still limited by the environment. However, the degrees of freedom the robot has access to have increased by some factor. In this sense, free will exists on a spectrum. If a person reflexively responds to their environment without much thought, one could say they are using extraordinarily little of their free will. However, if one becomes aware of the influences that affect them, this increases the sliding scale of freedom towards free will and away from reflexive responses. In this sense, one can gain more or less free will depending on their ability to utilize introspection and analysis. This freedom requires consciousness, another notion commonly disputed, which plays well into this argument. In her book, Conscious, by Annika Harris, she points out the difference between a being that is unconscious and a being that is conscious. Philosophers have long contended that a philosophical zombie, or a person who's indistinguishable from a real person but is not conscious, could be programmed to appear conscious. However, Harris points out that an unconscious being cannot reflect on something it does not have. Therefore, it cannot reflect on the nature of consciousness. So, when consciousness is conscious of itself, it is actively doing something. This cannot happen without consciousness, after all. The idea that consciousness is along for the ride is a popular one. After all, when you consciously choose to move your hand, your brain has decided to do so long before you are aware of it. However, if consciousness is doing something when it is conscious of consciousness, there is room for it to be functional in other areas. This feedback mechanism is where the functionality is found. Consciousness is the most parsimonious operation for ensuring survival in an evolutionary sense by allowing for awareness and its feedback into the conscious system. Consciousness contains awareness and informs the organism as to the contents of its environment in a way that would not be possible without it. Therefore, it may in fact be evolutionarily advantageous after all. A being that is unconscious has remarkably little free will on this hypothetical spectrum of the capacity to transcend one's environment. After all, 
this is taken from the first person perspective. Consciousness itself is where one finds the core of the attitude for free will, which is the reason the nonsensical idea of free will exists in the first place. A foundational truth grew into an imaginary concept, contextualized into a mythology. In a similar way, the magic of the ocean is embodied into the Greek god Poseidon. There was a core understanding that was taken to an impossible extreme. We can discredit the extreme, but what was it trying to say? Why does it exist? The answer can be found in the archetype of the hero. By archetype, I mean the literature form of the word, not the Jungian metaphysical version. The hero is one who fights destiny and takes control of the future with the powers that they contain within themselves. Predeterminism is a common enemy in fiction. The reason is not because it is scientifically untrue. Rather, it can be disempowering. If one believes that they can change the future, they become more than a victim of circumstance. They confront fate directly and make destiny a story that you write yourself. The reason is not that the future is not determined. The reason is the hero wants to own their own existence, to be, rather than to have happened. The philosopher Alan Watts described this paradox well in his talk, Do you do it? Or does it do you? In this talk, Alan points out an important point. If the universe is forcing your hand, you can appropriately say that you are being pushed around by the forces it contains. However, you can expand your perception and view things in a different way. As opposed to being pushed around by the forces that lead you to act, you are the very forces that inspire you to act. All of the things that lead up to you making a choice in reality, all of the forces, influences, and factors, all of those are you. One can identify with these variables and consider them no different than one's true self. In this sense, you are the will, the will of the universe, a will that is considered free in a perceptual way. I write my own destiny, and this is true even if I grant the arguments set forth by determinism. The core of my argument is that free will, in this sense, is a perceptual heuristic, a perspective that views reality in an empowering way that enhances conscious experience. This is commonly what people think of when they consider the notion of free will, as this is the attitude tied to the underlying concept. The task at hand for serious philosophers that desire an enchanted worldview without accepting impossibilities is how to separate the idea of free will from its associated attitude. This could be in redefining free will to make sense, or it could be in finding a new term to describe the concept, such as active determinism instead of predeterminism. After all, the universe does appear to be actively determined by your choices, at least in the first-person perspective. Personally, I adopt the compatibilist position, and I say I believe in free will in a way that makes sense simply expressing it as a perception and not an idea, a way of being in the world that can make it a better place. The illusion of self also plays into this concept. Although the homunculus in the head is certainly an illusion, as there is nowhere in the brain for it to be, the self can still be thought of in a way that does make sense. Rather than being the thinker of thoughts or the ghost in the machine, the self is simply the interface between reality and perception. The self is your heuristic for interpreting experience, the overall three-dimensional individual. The self in this sense contains the capacity for consciousness. This capacity for consciousness the self possesses, especially meta-consciousness or self-awareness, is the core of the attitude of free will as it allows the individual to pull themselves up by their own strings, creating a future that both creates and accepts the destiny before us, 
after all. If you're going to pull yourself up by your own strings, you have to see them. In conclusion, a version of the self does exist, which contains the capacity for free will as an attitude, which is supported by the notion consciousness is actually doing something. The last part is not necessary, as the attitude of free will is still possible if consciousness is indeed along for the ride. This analysis uses both Sam Harris's argument as well as crucial perspectives from his wife. Ironically, they use these arguments to defend the idea that free will does not exist, the self is entirely an illusion, and consciousness is not really doing anything. I use these same arguments and flip them around in a way that stays scientifically consistent, in a way that's intended for them to agree with. What do you think? Does the free self exist?